guys been, been blessed from the, uh, the message series, the series now, that we started about what we have in Christ? How many of you guys getting something out of that? Well, today we're going to continue. Um, this is part two of that series, knowing what we have in Christ. We have to know what we have in Christ. It's not just good enough to be in Jesus. We have to know what we have in Jesus. And I just, um, that message, I put it up last week, but today I put up another thumb, I put up a new thumbnail for that message with a treasure chest and with Christ, Christ on the treasure chest because, you know, that's how I look at Jesus in one sense. In one sense, I, I picture in my mind Jesus is like a treasure chest that's full of treasure that belongs to me. And it's up to me and it's up to you to find out what is in him for you. He's given us the treasure, but I need to dig in and find out what's mine. Last week, like I said, we talked about the fact that God placed us in Christ in order to justify us. He placed us in Christ to free us from the fear of men, and he placed us in him to free us from sin. And we covered those three points last week. And just always remember, you know, to be free from man means to be free from the fear of man. We're not supposed to live under the fear of man. We're not supposed to govern our actions based on what another man says that we should be doing ultimately because first and foremost, God is our authority. Then man, if they have rightful authority, because every man doesn't have authority over you. Know that too, okay? But those that God has placed an authority over us, we're to respect them under the authority of God, but we're not to fear man. And we are God's own possession. The theme scripture was in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Verses 19 and 20, which was for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no. But in him, it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him we utter our amen. And then in the Amplified Version, it says the same, same passage, as surely as God is trustworthy and faithful, and means what he says, our speech and message to you have not been yes, that might mean no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ the Messiah, who has been preached among you by us, by Silvanus, Timothy, by myself, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no. But in him, it is always the divine yes. For as many as are the promises of God, they all find their yes answer in him. For, for this reason, we also utter the amen to God through him in his person and by his agency to the glory of God. So when we agree with God concerning his promises, the Bible says we glorify God. When I say amen to what God has done for me and provided for me in Christ, I glorify God. So listen, so if that's true, then, that, then the opposite is also true. When I don't believe God and I don't claim the promises that belong to me in Christ, I don't glorify God. God wants his children to have what Jesus died to give them. God, let me say that again. God wants his children to have what Jesus died to give them because when I receive what God has given me in Christ, what does that cause me to do? It causes me to see how great and how wonderful God is, in, in which, which results in me giving him glory and honor and praise, which results in me telling others about how good he is, which results in me living my life for him because of his love for me. People say hatred is the most powerful force in the world. Some people believe that, but I'll tell you it's not true. You know what the most powerful thing is? It's God's love. God's love is the most powerful thing. Jesus said, no greater love that a man has in this than he would lay his life down for his friends. Love is powerful. The love of God is the most powerful force on the earth. God calls us to love. When I, when I talk about, when I experience the goodness of God, I will then respond by expressing it to the Lord, by saying amen, by telling 
my brothers and my, my, my sisters, by telling my neighbors. The Bible says that we're God's special people who are set, a, set apart to declare the praises of Him, to declare His praises. Hallelujah. So God says that I mean what I say when I pro according to my promises. They were not yes and no. <coughs> Excuse me. My promises are not yes and no. I mean what I said. That's why we can come to him with boldness and confidence when it comes to his promises and grab on to God. I love the story of Jacob. Jacob, when he wrestled God, because he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And what happens to Christians sometimes is they let go of God. They don't want to hold on to God. No, you hold on by faith until he blesses you, until he answers you, until he gives you what he promised. That's, that's the kind of faith we have to have. And so we're to claim the promises of God because God says that every promise in him are yes and amen. So I want to continue today on the, four, on the fourth point that I, that, I, that I left off on last week, which is in him we experience the fullness of God's love. And it's good that we're talking about this today because today is, again, today's Father's Day, right? And we celebrate our Father. We all have a Father. Isn't that awesome? We all have a father. And I can tell you right now, I'm speaking personally. I'm not speaking for anybody else. Since the, day, since the day that I got saved and met the Lord, I have never felt at one point or time in my life that God was not with me. When I said felt, I'm not talking about his tangible presence. I'm talking about an inner witness, a knowing in my heart. I have never felt that God, if, even if my mind tried to question God was with me, I know it would have to be a lie. I, I, I can't even say it because it's not true. I know the Lord is with me. I know he's been with me from the time that I met him till, to this, till, till this day. I know that the Lord is with me because he loves me. And he told me he was with me. He told me in the word and he told me when I heard his voice, I'm with you. I believe that. I cling to that word to this day. Over 20 years later, I still hold on to that, that first word that God ever spoke to me audibly. I am with you. He's with you. But he loves us today. In Christ, we experience the fullness of God's love. You know, when you talk to people outside of Christ, one of the reasons why it's hard for them to grasp, get a grasp on God is because they don't know the love of God. They don't understand God's love. God's love is personal. It's not just this general love. It's not just, I'm going to say, there's no such thing as a general love. Love is love, but... It, it, love is not, God's love is not this thing out there somewhere in the ether, right? In the unknown. God's love actually came here. God's love actually took on flesh and blood. And in Christ, His love is revealed to us. Outside or apart from Christ, we can't experience the love of God. We can hear about it. But the, 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 the way for a believer, for, for a human being, really to experience God's love is through and in Christ. We cannot experience the love of God apart from Christ because God chose to demonstrate his love towards us in Christ. He decided to do that. Romans chapter 8 and verse 39 says, Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And I think maybe I started this point last week, but I definitely didn't finish it if I started it. Nor, he says, nothing is able to separate you from God's love. Nothing is able to separate you. What that means is there is nothing that can cause God not to love you. There is nothing that can cause God not to love you. Oh, some Christians need to get a revelation of that. Because if you listen to some, how some Christians pray, they believe that they can do something that would cause God to not love them. Now, you can do things that cause God not to like you. You can do things that, cause, that God disapproves of, but God loves you. He never changes the way he thinks or feels about you. And just because God loves you doesn't mean that he's going to accept you either. Right? God loves the whole world, but that doesn't mean everybody's going to heaven. God proved his love to the world because he sent Jesus. That's the greatest proof and demonstration of the world. And like I told you guys the other day, I was talking to a forum of like, you know, a bunch of different people, atheists, lesbians, all this, gay, homosexuals, all these people, we were having a conversation. And they were like, well, 
you know, why can't you just accept the fact that these people are this way? Why do you have to say that you disagree with their lifestyle? I say, well, well because I believe the word of God. And if I accept that, that means I would reject God. And they said, well, you know, you demonstrate, this is what they say, you display hatred. You demonstrate hatred towards others when you don't accept them. And you don't accept how they live. And I said, that's not true. I said, that's not true. I can love you and hate what you do. That's not true. That's what God did. God hated our sin. And he demonstrated his love towards us by taking our sin on himself. If somebody ever tells you, you don't love me if you don't accept what I'm doing, they don't know what love is. Because you can love somebody without accepting their foolery. You can love somebody without accepting their sin. Somebody says, if you don't allow me to do this, or if you don't accept this, about, and it's evil or it's wrong in God's sight, or even if it's not wrong necessarily in God's sight, if it's just not something that you, do, you agree with or you, you don't like it, and they say, you have to accept this or you don't love me and you don't have a, a you genuinely don't have a, a real, you know, you, you know there's, there's no real, um, you know, animosity towards them. You know, you just don't like the thing that they're doing. Then you, 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 you be, better watch out. That's one of the ways that people control and manipulate others. God says, no, you can love somebody without loving their behavior. Jesus proved that. Jesus demonstrated God's love to the world. So don't be led astray by somebody that says, well, you have to accept my bad behavior, and if you don't, you don't love me. That's nonsense. The scripture says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, it says, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And that's basically what I just said. It wasn't that we love God. It was that God loved us. And he demonstrated his love towards us when he sent his son to bear our sins and to be the propitiation for our sins. And that means that Jesus, the propitiation, means that he became God's appeasing sacrifice. He became the sacrifice that bore our sins to appease God's wrath that was on us. The scripture says that if you are not in Christ, the wrath of God already abides on you. That's why people make me laugh when they see... When they, when they see somebody do a, you know, an evil deed or something bad, and they say, well, you're going to go to hell. Well, if you're not saved, you're going to go to hell too. Because the Bible says that the wrath of God abides on those who are outside of Christ. The, Christ is the salvation from God's wrath. If you're not in Christ, if you're not in the ark of Christ, the ark of salvation, you're under the wrath of God right now. That's where you live. You live out in the wrath of God. And the, and the ice can break from underneath your feet and you can fall in at any moment if you're not in Christ. But the Bible says that God demonstrated his love towards us by, by sending Christ to be our propitiation, our appeasing sacrifice to save us and deliver us from our sins. And we didn't deserve it. He loves us. And we only experience, as I said, we, we only experience, we can only experience God's love in Christ. You want to know how much God loves you? Begin to meditate on what Jesus actually did for you. For you. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17 in the Amplified Version, it says, And may Christ through your faith actually dwell, settle down, abide, make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love. What is the breadth and length and height and depth of it? Listen to what he says. He says, 
He says you have to be rooted, your relationship with God has to be rooted in God's love in order for you to experience the fullness of His love. That means if, you're, if, you, if your relationship with God is based on anything, um, anything other than God's love for you, you're never going to be able to experience God's love in the fullness, in, in fullness. And that's God's plan. God wants us to know His love. God wants you to know His love. When you know how much God loves you, you'll do anything for God. When you know how much God loves you, you won't question God when He says, take your son, your only son, to the mountain that, uh, and to the place where I will show you and then tie him up and offer him as a sacrifice. When you know the love of God, you'll do that. Abraham loved God. The Bible says, faith worketh by love. When you love God, you'll do anything God tells you to do because you actually believe that He loves you. And, and whatever, all, all, whatever He tells you to do is going to work out for your good. But see, when you don't know the love of God, then you have trust issues. And you think, man, if I obey God, I might lose this. Like the monkey with the peanuts. You know, the monkey, the, 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 anybody ever heard of the story of how they hunt monkeys in Africa? Right? They dig a hole. They dig a hole just big enough for the monkey to stick his hand in and they stuff it with peanuts, and then they, they go and hide, and the monkeys come, and they come and they smell the peanuts, and then they find the peanuts in the holes, and they stick their hand in the hole to get the monkey, but then they grab a handful of peanuts, and because their fist is bald, right, they can't get their hand out. And so they're trying to yank their hand out of the hole, but they won't let the peanuts go. And so the hunters would walk right up to the monkeys while they're screaming, and trying to get away, trying to get away from the hunters, but they refused to let the peanuts go, and the hunters come and with a club, and they hit them upside the head. And, that, and that's, how they, that's how they catch them. And that's how many people are today. God is like, let the peanuts go so you can experience the freedom in my love. And many Christians don't trust God enough to, when he says, let it go, they won't let it go. And then the devil comes with a club and beats them upside the head, and he says, I got you. And the only way we, we, we're able to do that is when we trust in the love of God. I trust that what God has for me, what He tells me to let go of, or what He tells me to pick up is for my good, is going to be for my benefit. I trust God. I trust God that even though these peanuts might taste good, I like peanuts, but I don't like them enough to lose my life for them or lose my freedom. What's worth more? He said that His love when we know His love, it'll fill us. And he, God, God's desire is for us to know the height and the depth and the length of His love. He wants us to know the fullness of His love. He wants us to know that. He said in verse 19 again, He says that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ, which far surpasses knowledge without experience. Because see, that's what a lot, a lot of people have. They have knowledge of God's love without experience. It's one thing to hear somebody talk about the love of God, but it's a whole other thing that when God touches you with His love and you experience His love for you. Fear will drive people. See, some people serve God out of fear. But when you, serve, when you do something out of fear, you're always looking for a way of escape. That's how some people are with their relationship with God. They only serve God because they're afraid of Him. And so they're looking for... When you're afraid, how many know when you're a slave to something and you're a slave out of fear, you're looking for a way to escape. Because fear, the Bible says, fear brings the thought of punishment, the expectation of punishment. And when you don't know God's love, you're expecting punishment. And God doesn't want us to serve Him out of... When I say fear, I'm not talking about godly fear. That's different. I'm talking about being terrified and afraid that God is going to do you harm. That kind of fear. That's not what God wants to lead us by. He says He wants us to know His love. He wants us to know how much He loves us. He wants us to be full of His love through experience, not just hearing about the love of God. That's not enough. You need to know the love of God. Ask God. Like I, We prayed for some, some of you guys earlier today. And if you, again, if you didn't come up, ask the Lord. I want to know your love. I want to experience your love. I don't just want to hear about your love. 
I don't just want to sing about your love. I don't just want to read about your love. I want to experience your great love for me. The love of God will tear you up. It'll, 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 <laughs> it'll wreck you, man. It'll wreck you. It'll cause you to do anything for him. God loves us, and we experience his love in Christ. The next point I want to make, the next thing I want to talk about that we have in Christ is sanctification. The Bible says in him we've been sanctified. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2 says, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. The scripture says that not only were the Corinthians sanctified, but all believers everywhere that call on the name of the Lord have been made holy. That's what it means to be sanctified. Some people, you know, you know, in, in some, some places they get up and say, I've been saved and sanctified. And you ask them, oh, you're holy? And they'll say, I didn't say I was holy, brother. Well, that's what it means. That's what, that's what it means. To be sanctified means to be made holy. And you are holy. And you should know that. Because guess what? When you believe that, you'll start acting like it. Holy means to be separated from the rest. When you, when you believe that you're holy, you're not going to live like everybody. You're not going to talk like everybody. You're not going to walk like everybody. You're not going to sound like everybody. You're going you're to you're live as one who has been set apart by the Lord for the Lord. You've been, God says that I set you apart for me, not for the world. God made us holy for Him. He says, okay, this is everybody, but you, my children, I'm setting you apart from everybody because you're my family. You're for me. You belong to me. God made us holy. He sanctified us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11 says, And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The, the scripture says, you were sanctified. You were made holy by G in Jesus' name, through Jesus' name and the Holy Ghost that lives in you. The Holy Spirit, who, who is God, when He moved in, He took up residence in your body, you became the holy temple of God. That's what you are. Not this place that we're in today. It's a nice building, but it's not the holy temple of God. And many Christians have it twisted. There, the Bible says in the book of Acts that God no longer dwells in temples made by man's hands. There is no building on the face of this earth today that God recognizes as a holy place. Not one. Yet you have many deceived, unfortunately, they're still saved, but they're deceived along these lines because they believe that when we build this building out of brick and mortar with our own hands, God's going to come and His presence is going to dwell in there. And as soon as you step in that building, you're in the holy presence of God. That's not Bible. That's actually anti-Bible. Jesus did away with that in Himself when He established a new covenant. There is, the Bible says, God no longer dwells in temples made by man's hands. Now you can dedicate a place to the worship of God. That's fine. But God doesn't live in there. When you come into a building, I don't care how nice it is. I don't care how much gold it has. I don't care how ornamented it is. I don't care how old it is. It could have been, it could have been, been built a thousand years ago somewhere in Europe. I, it doesn't matter. God does not live there. His presence does not abide there. The only temple that God recognizes as holy today is you. And what people do is they've turned their attention away from themselves as being God's temple and put it on a building. Well, guess what? When you turn your attention away from yourself as being the temple of God, guess what you're not going to live like? You're not going to live like one who's holy. You're not going to live like one who has been set apart. You're going to be loose and you're going to do all kinds of things and you're going to act all kinds of ways because you don't see yourself as being God's temple. You see that building as being God's temple. And that, I believe that, 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 that teaching and that way of thinking is straight from hell. I believe it 100%. Because as a result of that, I've seen with my own eyes the results of that where God's people don't live sanctified lives because they don't believe that they're sanctified. 
When you believe that you're sanctified, you're going to treat yourself differently. You're going to act holy. I didn't understand this correctly when I first got saved, but I felt it. I felt, the f I knew I was washed. I knew I was cleansed. I knew that God lived in me. I knew I was holy. If you asked me at the time, I probably wouldn't have said I was holy, but the way that I experienced Jesus, I was living like a holy person, but I misunderstood. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even get around sinners because I didn't understand. If you weren't saved, I didn't even want you to touch me. I'm just being honest. When I first got saved, because I didn't understand. And I only knew the Old Testament. And I knew that if something was holy, something that was not holy, you're not supposed to touch it. So I, I used to love to play baseball with, with people that weren't saved. I stopped playing baseball. They used to be looking for me. Why don't you play? But I didn't want to get defiled. I thought, man, if I hang out with you guys, I'll be defiled. And I was incorrect in my thinking. I, but what I did was I, I believe that even though I was, I was incorrect in the way I thought about holiness or understood it, I do believe that I was correct in setting myself apart because I needed to develop a relationship with God before I started hanging out with people so that I could know who I was in Christ. And that was very beneficial for me. But the way I thought about it or I went about it was wrong. I literally thought if I hung out with you, I'd get defiled. I, I literally thought that if I heard words that were un, uh, unholy or sinful in my ears, I would get defiled. Think about that. So that means I was walking around trying not to hear evil. So you know, see no evil, hear no evil. You can't do that, man. You can't do that. Now, you can prevent yourself from seeing and hearing evil on purpose. The Bible says that I will put no evil before my eyes, but you can't prevent yourself from seeing evil as a human being because evil is going to show you itself. Right? But we are holy, and I had a sense of that holiness after when I got saved. I understood in my inner man, I am clean. I don't want other people to get me dirty. And, for, and, and so I went to the wrong extreme. But let me say this to you. As a child of God, be careful who you associate with. Make sure that you're not defiled by, not by letting people touch you, but by doing the actions that unholy people do. Because that's how you defy yourself. You're, the, you're holy. You're the temple of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 says, And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. Jesus became our sanctification. Jesus was the one, excuse me, who enabled us to become holy. N notice what he said, you are holy. You are holy. See, because you got some Christians on one side of the fence that say, they'll say, well, we're becoming holy, brother. Or we're being sanctified. And that's partially true. But, but that's not fully true. Right? The Bible does say we are being sanctified. But what that means is we are walking out our sanctification. Meaning, I am growing in my holy actions. Because I'm holy, I'm now learning how to live holy. You have one set of Christians that believe that that's all that we do. We are trying to be holy through our actions. That sounds to me kind of like something called the law, doesn't it? Doesn't the law speak like that? The Old Testament? That we are to become righteous through acting righteous? No. Holiness comes to me first as a free gift. Then I walk out my holiness. You understand? Because if, I, if it doesn't happen that way, then I'm now under the law. I'm, a, I'm like the Jews. No, the Bible says, be holy, for I am holy because God made you holy. In Him, it says, we have been sanctified, not will be. We are holy. In Him, we are made alive. You are alive in Christ. I don't know if you know this or not, but the Bible says, before you were in Jesus, you were dead. D-E-A-D, -E unto God. You are alive unto sin, but you are dead to God. How many know, before you got saved, it felt like something was separating you from God? You knew God was out there, but He wasn't in your reality. He wasn't real to you. How many know what I'm talking about? Because the Bible says the reason why you felt that way is because you were dead to God. You were dead to God. But in Christ, we've been made alive to God. We talked about this recently. We were talking about it in John chapter 17 about what eternal life is. 
God's eternal life is what made us alive to God. That's what caused us to be alive, to be quickened unto the Lord. Listen to what it says here in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22. It says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And then in Romans 6, 12, it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present your, yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members, your body parts, to God as instruments for righteousness. God says that's what you are to do now. You can do that now. You're to do that now. Present your body parts as instruments of righteousness to the Lord. Now listen to what it says in Romans chapter, chapter 5. I'm going to start at verse 12. We're talking about being made alive to God. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all died. Excuse me. Death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Who was that? Adam was a type of Jesus. And a lot of Christians don't understand Jesus because they don't understand Adam. Let me say that again. The scripture says that Adam was a type of the one who was to come. Ad when you understand who Adam was, what his response, his God-given responsibilities were, what God viewed the first man as, and then you, you look at Jesus, you will better understand what Jesus is and what, what his role is in our lives, and you better understand Adam. Jesus, the Bible says Adam was like Jesus. In what way? Adam was the, the father of a species. This is one of the reasons why many Christians don't live like a new creation. Because they don't, they, don't, they don't compare Jesus to Adam. The Bible says Adam was the first of a species. When Adam was created, he was the first of his kind. There was no other creature on earth like Adam. He was the first of a new species. If Adam was like Jesus, then what does that mean Jesus was? Jesus is also the first man or first kind of a new species of man. When you understand that and believe that, you're going to look at yourself differently. You're going to say, I am of a different kind of species of man. I am of a different kind of, I'm a different kind of man. The Bible says Adam was a kind of Jesus. And Adam brought, again, he brought sin into the world. And as a result, he brought death upon all men because all men sin. Right? So he says in verse 15, but the fruit, now he talks about what Jesus, the greater Adam, did. The one who was, he was, he, was, he was the last Adam, but the Bible says he was greater. This is why. But the free gift is not like the trespass. He's saying, now let's, look at, let's compare these two. We talked about Adam's trespass and what it did to the world. Brought death and sin to all men. But he says that the free gift is not like the transgression. One of them is greater. Let's find out which one is greater. He said, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So he says, what Jesus did for us is much more than what Adam did to us. Listen, this is important. You get a hold of this, you'll, you'll develop a righteousness consciousness Listen to what he says. He says, he's talking about the trespass of Adam versus the free gift of God that came through Jesus. And he says, Adam only committed one trespass that brought sin and death to the whole world. But Jesus, Jesus' act of salvation was greater because his one act brought salvation or made salvation and redemption possible 
for the whole world. So which one was greater? The one who committed one act that affected all or the one who committed one act that can save all? You know, they always say it's always better to, it's always easier to break something than it is to fix it, right? You ever heard that? Even in common sense tells us that, right? It's easier to, 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 to break something than to fix it, right? Like the bottle that just got break. Just one, I don't know what happened, but it, some, something hit it over and it broke. If you wanted to fix that bottle, it'll take you a while because you got to find all the pieces. You got to glue it back together, put it together. It's going to take so much, right? But to break it is one, it, it takes one moment, one instant. And that's why it's saying what Jesus did for us is greater because Adam, through one act, he broke the world. But through Jesus' great act, he fixed the entire world or he made provision for the entire world to be fixed. And he will fix it. For those who won't be saved, they're going to be destroyed. And then God is going to renew the world because of what Jesus did. And so this is why Jesus is greater. Do you believe that Jesus is greater than Adam? Because I'm telling you right now, that one of the number one, we're talking about this in our Wednesday night Bible studies and new creation realities. One of the biggest problems in the Christian church, one of the greatest problems is that Christians believe that Adam is greater than Jesus in them. They don't believe that Jesus is greater than Adam. But the Bible clearly says that Jesus is greater. Again, he says in verse, verse 15, he says, But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more, much more, have the grace and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. He's saying what Jesus did for us is not like what Adam did to us. Adam's act brought condemnation. That's not what Jesus came to bring. The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 17, for, for the Son did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If you listen to some preachers, if you listen to what they're preaching, it, it almost sounds like Jesus came to condemn the world. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. If the world chooses to reject my salvation, they are already condemned. That's why I mentioned earlier, most people don't even understand. They think that there's a, they, most people think there's a 50-50% chance that they're going to get saved or they're, they're going to go to heaven or they're going to go to hell. No, there is a 100, 100, 100% chance that you're going to hell without Jesus. Jesus is the only salvation from hell. You're already condemned without Jesus. You're already condemned. You're already on, on thin ice without Jesus. The Bible says that what Jesus did was not like the transgression of Adam. The Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus did not come to condemn us, but to save us. We were already condemned. All God had to do was just leave Jesus in heaven and everybody would have went to hell. People don't understand that because many of them have heard an incorrect gospel and they think God is gonna judge you God is gonna condemn you No, the Bible says you are already judged from the very first sin you ever committed in your life if you're not in Jesus you're already condemned you're already guilty and there's a sentence of death over your head already if you're not in Christ but many people don't believe that because they've not heard the gospel correctly Jesus said, God did not send me, he was not sent to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He says here again, verse 16, and the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the trespass brought, excuse me, for the judgment, for judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. How many glad that you're innocent today through Jesus, that he declared you just you're, you're not guilty because of him. He covered your transgressions and washed them all away. Hallelujah. It says in verse 17, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through, the, through that one man, much more, I love it, Paul is making a point. He keeps saying, 
much more, much more Jesus, much more Jesus than Adam, much more, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. What does he mean by reign in life? What does he mean by reign in life? He means that you're no longer dominated by sin that leads to death because you have, you've been made righteous. You are no longer under... How, how many ever see a, somebody, or maybe you watched a movie, right? Somebody that's on death row. If somebody, somebody's on death row and they're just waiting to die, are they living their best life? You know why not? Because they're just waiting to die. And everything that they do and everything that they think and everything, everything that they feel, it, it is all being affected by the fact that they know that there's a death sentence on them. And they're headed straight for death. When we receive God's life in us, the Bible says that we can now reign in life. I can now reign in life because I'm not a slave to fear, the fear of death. I don't have to get up and worry it at all because I'm reigning and I'm, I'm alive. I have the life. There's no longer the death sentence over me. God removed it. And every human being has a death sentence outside of Christ. And whether or not they're consciously living, living their lives out of that, they are, even if, they're, if they don't know it. That's what fear brings. Fear, the source of fear in man is death. Fear is the foundation, death is the foundational fear in man. And everything that human beings do is based in some form out of that fear. You have never met a person outside of Jesus that, does not that is not being affected by the fear of death. Even if it's not constantly on their mind. You know how I know? Because you have never met a person that ever lived like Adam. Have you ever met a person that... I'm talking about the first Adam before he sinned. Have you ever met a person that lived like Adam? Because every one of us has had the fear of death. Now, in Christ, we've been redeemed from that. Thank God. And we no longer are un, we're, we're no longer living under the fear of death. The Bible says that we rule and reign in life with Jesus. Now, and then it says in verse 18, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So the scripture says that by, by Jesus' obedience, we were made righteous. That's why we are to be righteousness conscious people and not sin conscious. And I know I say that a lot, guys, but this is so important because we, we live in a world that's always telling us to be sin conscious. We live in a world that always tells us that you have to, you have to be reminded constantly of your mistakes, your failures, your, your whatever it is. You're not perfect. Your imperfection. We're being reminded constantly of these things. And we have to realize that, listen, God says you need to be righteousness conscious. You need to be conscious of the fact that in me, I did much more for you than what Adam did to you. My righteousness as a free gift that I gave to you is far greater and far superior, more superior and far stronger than the unrighteousness that you lived in before I came into your life. You have to accept that. You have to believe it. The Bible says, in Him, we are triumphant. In Him, we are triumphant. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. Now, I mentioned this earlier, so I'm, uh, not too long ago, I'm not, not going to get too much in that. But the Bible says that He always causes us to triumph in Christ. And then in Him, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we become a new kind of man. We become a new species of man. Adam, when he was created, he was a new species that the earth had never seen. 
God had already created all the other animals, all the other birds, all the fish of the sea. And then the Bible says on the sixth day, that's why the Bible says that the number six is the number of a man. Some people didn't know that, like 666 in the book of Revelation. Why does the Bible say that the number six is the number of man? Because man was created on the sixth day. 666 in and of itself, or six in and of itself is not an evil number. It's just depicting the day that man was made. And the mark of the beast, part of the reason why the mark of the beast is the number six is because it's, it's where it's, it's the time, it's going to be the time in the earth where man will cast off God and say outright and openly, we are God. That's why that number 666 is the, is the mark of the beast. 666 is not an evil number in and of itself. It's what it represents that's evil, the number of man. Where man will say, I am God. That's what the Bible says the Antichrist is going to say. I'm God. Where man will say, I'm God. And people are already saying it in their hearts, but when the church is removed, somebody made a joke about the rapture the other day. Remember? Was it you that told me about the rapture? Somebody posted something. What was it? Somebody said, uh, they, uh, unbeliever was, I remember, an unbeliever said, they <laughs> They, they posted a joke and said, I'm praying for the rapture so that God could take these Christians out of here. That's what somebody said. Huh? huh? And, and let, them live, let them live their sinful lives in peace. That's what they said. I'm praying to God so that God would take the Christians out so we can live in peace. But they don't understand. The Bible says that the only thing preventing all evil and all hell from breaking loose on this earth is you. When the church is taken away, there's going to be nothing here for perversion and unrighteousness and all the filth that we're seeing. We're seeing it, but we're not seeing it in any kind of way the world is going to see it when the church is taken away. When the body of Christ leaves the earth, the Bible says hell is going to break loose. People, wickedness will take place like, like we've never known. And people don't understand that. They think, like, like, like that person that posted that, they think, well, I don't want the church, I want the Christians gone so that I can live comfortably in my sin. Well, sin ain't going to be comfortable at that point because the wrath of God is going to come and start judging people for seven years because of their sin and their rebellion. And, you know, so pe people need to understand that you, you better thank God that Christians are here because God dwells in the church. Some people believe that when the Bible talks about that in Thessalonians, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit will be taken away, and he that letteth will let until he is taken away, and then will that man of sin be revealed. Well, it can't just be the Holy Spirit, because guess what? If the Holy Spirit's taken away, I'm going with him. You think the Holy Spirit's going to leave the earth and leave me on the earth? My Bible says that God gave me his Spirit to dwell with me forever. So if the Holy Spirit's taken away, guess who's going away with the Holy Ghost? I'm going. Now, some of you guys might not know what I'm talking about, but there's a teaching that says that before the Antichrist is revealed, the Holy Spirit is going to be taken away. Some people believe that the church is going to be taken away. Okay? Well, the, if the Holy Spirit gets taken away, guess what? The church gets taken away too because the Holy Spirit lives in the church. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me because God's not going to leave me here without His Spirit. Those people that believe that, I mean, maybe he'll leave them, but he's not going to leave me. My Bible says he'll never leave me. The Bible says he gave me his Holy Spirit to be with me forever. So when the church is gone, this world is going to look like something you never recognized before. People don't understand that. You, they want a little bit of good and a little bit of righteousness just so that they can have peace. But listen, all of that is going to go when we go. And the world is going to the Bible says the time of trouble like the world has never known is going to take place. So we be, we are, we're a new kind of man. We're a new species in him, guys. We, Jesus made us something altogether new, just as Adam was made altogether new. Nobody else was like Adam when he was created. All the other creatures were different. When you were recreated in Christ, you became a new creation. See yourself in that light. You were created in the image of Christ. It says in Romans 6, 4, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just 
as Christ was raised from the dead by the, the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And then, in Christ, the next point, in Christ, we have the new covenant, or we are in the new covenant. Hallelujah. Thank God for the new covenant. Thank God for the new relationship that we have with God that took place in Christ. It says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 17, And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Listen to what Paul is saying in Galatians. Paul is saying that the new covenant was predicted and promised even before the old covenant. And when the old covenant came, it could not do away with, God, with what God had already previously promised to Abraham. The new covenant was already promised to Abraham. And when the old, that's why people who preach the law and they say, well, the old covenant was first, so the old covenant is more important. They don't even know what the Bible says. The Bible said God had predicted and promised the, old, the new covenant even before the old. And they, they're looking and they're clinging to this old covenant. And they say, well, God said this first, so it's more important. No, he didn't talk about the old covenant first. Study the word. God promised Abraham the new covenant. The, old, the law came 430 years after that promise. Let me read it again. It says, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ... He's, now, God is talking about a covenant that he confirmed in Jesus. He says, now, the law, that's the Old Testament, which was 430 years after, after this covenant that God confirmed in, through, to, to Abraham. The law came after. So the next time somebody preached the Old Covenant to you and say, the Old Covenant is more important because it's first, say, no, 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 you don't understand. The Old Covenant came after the promise of the new. It's superior. It was promised before, but revealed in Christ. It says, and this is why he says, and it cannot, meaning the law cannot disannul that it should make the promise of no effect. He's saying that the law, because it came after God's original promise of the new covenant, cannot make the new covenant without effect. It cannot cancel out the new covenant because God promised the new covenant before the law. You know how many people have never heard that? They've never heard it because they've never been taught it. Because unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't, they don't, don't understand the new covenant. They've not been taught it. And, and people walk around thinking that the old covenant was superior. No, man, it wasn't superior. The new covenant was promised by God before the old covenant ever existed. The Bible says that in Christ we are one. We, the body, are one. Galatians 3.28 says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Meaning, in God's eyes, God does, in Him, in Christ, God does not put man over woman. God does not put slave over free. God does not look at your status, your earthly status, and, and say, you're more, you're more special than that person because you own a company or because you're, you know, you, you have this status or, you know, you're more um, intelligent or whatever it is that the world judges people by. God says, no, in me, everybody's equal. I love all my kids the same, and I give them all the same uh, status in me, in him. He's talking about relational-wise, and that's important because that means if you're a woman, then you get all that a man would get in Christ, your inheritance. In, in, the, in, the, in this day and time, you got to understand, that was revolutionary. In our day, you know, that's something normal that people don't really think about. you got to understand the times that they live in. For God to say, in him, the one... <laughs> Listen, for God to say, I'm giving you a treasure, an inheritance in my son, and I'm not restricting anything 
in, to anyone, no matter their status. That was revolutionary, guys. That was uncommon. See, when people say the Bible is like, what is it, what do they, they call it? Like against women, anti-feminists and stuff like that. They don't know what they're talking about. The Bible, actually, if you look at history, the, the Christian faith is one of the greatest motivation, motivators for women's liberation and women's rights. Because, you know, before God made, you know, made, a, made himself more widely known, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the world, through, through Christianity, women and kids and people were thought of as property men in, 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 Greek, in Roman society. You could kill your wife and your kids if you wanted to. If they, you legally, and not get any punishment for it, if you just were not happy with them, you could kill them. You know how that changed? When Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire, people's view on life changed. And they began to view life as sacred because God valued life. So people began to value life the same way God valued life. And women and children and slaves were elevated in their value in the eyes of men because of your Christian faith. Yet you have people that are ignorant preaching, well, the Bible puts women down. What Bible are you reading? This is why, this is why we ha it's, it's so important for us to know what we believe, to know what we believe. That's one of the reasons why I teach church history to you guys, so that you guys can have an understanding of the effect that the church had on the earth. When people criticize the church, do you know that the Christians invented hospitals? Do you know that most cr Christians invented charities? There were no organizations set up to help people who are not their own countrymen and who are not their own family in the earth. You know where that started? That started from Christianity, from the compassion that God put in his people to reach those that, need, that had needs. That came from Christianity. Christians invented hospitals. Christians invented charities. All these things that the world is benefiting from today came through the church. And they said, well, I can't wait for these Christians to get raptured. All of the things that God wrought through the church in and through Christians is going to go too. And then they're going to be sorry when we, when we get taken away. They're going to be sorry. The Bible says that we're one in Christ. There is no bond, there is no free, there is no male, there is no female. God looks at us equally in Christ. In Christ, the Bible says, faith and love avails. Faith and love avails. Galatians 5 and verse 6 says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And this goes kind of with the, the, the previous point that I just made, that in Christ, your, your physical attributes don't matter. Your lineage doesn't matter. You got these people running around talking about the Hebrew Israelites, and these people talking about, okay, well, the Jews thought that they were superior because they were physically descendants of Abraham. And the Bible says in Christ, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The Bible says, it, don't glory in the flesh. It says, let no man glory. It says, if any man glory, let him not glory in the flesh. Don't glory because you're from the Bahamas. Some people from the Bahamas, you know, they have this idea, oh, we know, we know this or we know, no, just be humble. If God gave you something or revealed something or blessed you with a gift that's greater than other people, say, thank you, Lord. And have a humble attitude about what you've become or what you've received from God because it's through grace. So no one can boast. The Bible says God's salvation is a free gift that no one should boast. People, when, when you boast, you become blind to your backside. You become blind to your open spot. That's what pride does. It causes you to, to have no armor. Because you're boasting about what you have and who you are. And you, you can't see that you're, you're, the devil's got a sword getting ready to stab you in the back. The Bible says, let him that boast, boast in the Lord. Not in anything else, because everything else is fallible. So it says, only faith and love avails. And that word avail means faith and love are the only things that move God. It has power with God. Not your, not your, not your lineage or your heritage. If you want to move God, don't come to God and say, God, you know, my grandfather, my great-grandfather started this and he was this preacher or she, you know, whatever. No, no, that doesn't move God. Your faith and your love has power with God. 
Your faith and your love is what moves God. Not your natural whatever. Look at, what, look at Jesus. Like, when Jesus, when Jesus came, you know, to his own, the Bible says his own didn't receive him, you know, and the Roman Empire was ruling over that region, and, and you had some people, when Jesus was performing miracles, that were not Jews that would come to Jesus. There was a centurion that came to Jesus, and his son was sick, and he asked Jesus to heal him. And Jesus said, I have not seen faith like this in all of Israel. Jesus was not interested in the fact that, that the Jews around him were their people. That man got what he needed from God because he believed. He believed God. And he got what he needed for his child. Faith and love avails with God. In Christ, we have the blessing, the Bible says. We have the blessing. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. We're blessed in Him. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has blessed us, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. He has blessed us with His grace. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That means everything you need is in Christ. And then the last point that I want to make today, I could expound it on some of these, but I wanted to make sure that I got through this message today. You can go back over it, meditate on it, look up other scriptures on it. But the, the last point that I want to make today is this. In Christ, God makes known the mystery of his will. In Christ. That means you can't know God's will apart from Jesus. You have to come to Jesus first if you want, to, if you want God to unfold his plan and his mystery to you. The Bible says in him, God's mystery is revealed and he makes known his, the mystery of his will according to his purpose, not my purpose. When we don't look to Christ, we try to, we try to live out our own purpose. Well, what is my purpose? Well, this is what I think I should do, but this is what I feel I should do instead of seeking God. The Bible says that God's mystery is revealed, not just his general mystery, but specifically for your life and how you fit in there. I knew I would be right where I am today because God revealed it to me. I'm not where I am today because I decided that this is the path of life that I'm going to take. Even when I had a desire to do it. I didn't do it until God told me to do it. God revealed his will to me. But even in a general sense, people can't understand what God did for them in Christ because, only in, because God only revealed, or God, let me rephrase it, many people today don't understand what God is doing in the earth or what he wants to do in their lives because it's found in Christ. I have to come to Christ. I have to come to Christ and submit to him. These are some of the things that we have in Christ today, guys. And you know, it's like I said earlier, view, view what God has given you and view what he's done for you like a treasure chest. And you want to be the type of person that's a treasure hunter. You're right? I'm searching, I'm seeking to find in Christ what belongs to me and then appropriate it to my life. By saying yes, amen, that's mine.